So do you guys want us to perform or pastor you this morning? Oh, pastor me. I'm so glad that we just got done with a time of worship and prayer. Because I believe that God has a specific word for this church as we get into today's sermon. Guys, we want to start off with reminding you of some of the things that um, God has shown us over the last year. Uh, we're going to take a minute to walk through our purpose and our mission, vision, and values again. Is that okay? Yeah. Are you with us this morning? Yeah. You awake? Yeah. Full of sugary donuts and caffeine? Oh, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Good. <laughs> Amen. So, to, let's walk through these together. Our first one that we... Um, th that we have is our purpose. And that, do you guys remember what that is? Yes. Yeah. What? Tell me. They Come on, dude. They need a reminder. There, the there we go. To gather. And it's to gather those called by their father to know him in order to make him known. We see that in Malachi chapter 4. And what God has shown us is that of everything that we're doing, of all the details that we can get into, of all the different ways that we can get it done, what we're really doing is we're setting up a place for us to make our Father known and to bring others to come and meet with Him. Amen? And then our mission is to grow, and it's to grow those called by their Father to know Him. Uh, and Oh, that one. I've got a duplicate here. That's okay. Um, and our mission was to grow those who come to... Uh, to come and know their father. And then we had our vision is to give fully mature sons and daughters to all nations until the full harvest has come in. The bride has made herself ready and King Jesus is, is enthroned in Jerusalem. Guys, these are all big vision. This is a big mission. This is, uh, this is a lot that we're looking at ahead of us, right? But what, what we want to share with you guys today is that it might be a big vision. It might be a lot to take care of might be a lot of responsibility it's weighty on each of us right but it doesn't have to be complicated we're excited for the days where uh we're excited that we are living in the days of what revelation eleven fifteen describes as uh, as this it says then the seventh angel sounded and there were loud voices in heaven saying the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our lord and of his christ and he will reign forever and ever we are seeing the progression Right now of the kingdoms of this world becoming the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. And as we're seeing this Holy Spirit take over on our entire world, we also see the warfare that's going on. Right? Yeah. We have a few of you who are going to go out and proclaim the name of Jesus and to go and live out that purpose that we talked about. It's to gather people to come and meet your Father in heaven. And you're going to do it in the middle of those who are protesting the re recent progress that we've had in our government. There are going to be a whole population of people out there who do not see what you see, who do not know the Father like how you know Him. And yet, we're seeing a takeover by the Holy Spirit in our community. This is what we all look forward to. Every knee bowing down before our God. This will be difficult as each one of us are pouring out our lives, but it doesn't have to be complicated, church. Say it doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be complicated. In fact, today's message is called Simple Man. Say Simple Man. Simple Man. We want to show you today the ways that we can kill the genuineness of what God is doing in each of our families and in the entire family of Remnant Church by complicating the work that He has given us to do. Amen. Y'all ready for this word this morning? So let me ask you a question. This week, have you faced any challenges? Yeah. How many have been challenged this past week in their walk with Christ? How many have had sin exposed within them due to constant weight of responsibility on their shoulders? It's like when you go to the grocery store, you get a bunch of snacks that you like and you're excited to take it home. And you want to go bring all the groceries inside and you pick up a lot of weight, but you start dropping things along the way. What God's been showing me and what he's been teaching Pastor Kaysen and I is that God is expanding how much we can carry. Yeah. And in this expansion, we're coming to realize all the areas that we're probably needing to get right with the Lord. It's one thing to be able to, to look amazing and do excellent in a playground. 
But whenever you actually get onto the field, you start to realize, man, like, I need to grow up. I need to be equipped. I need to grow in the things of God. Well, church, I want to tell you that today, that's what God's asking of us. He's asking us to be simple men. And what I mean by that is that there's only a few things that we need to be doing in our lives. And we're going to help that define that for you this morning. We want to remind you this morning the reasons why we do what we do. And God's, and, our, and God's expectation and how we respond to this constant responsibilities we face each day in our life. A principle that you may have heard before is more stuff equates to more problems. Has anybody heard something like that before? That's true. It's true. The more that we surround ourselves with things outside the will of God, it will produce more problems for yourself. There's a ton of things that you're walking through right now, and some hardships that aren't the Lord. And what's the problem is, is you're now carrying hardships for the Lord, and you're also carrying hardships because of your flesh. We want to talk about the simplicity of walking with God this morning. Jesus was not anxious about his schedule as he walked the earth. Come on, guys. Think about that for a minute. Jesus was not anxious about getting from one appointment to another appointment. He knew where he was supposed to be, when he was supposed to be there, and with whom he would be there with. That's a security that each one of us can have. Are you, you guys want to have that security and that freedom today? Yeah. You're not running and sprinting from one thing in your life to the next, to the next, to the next, trying to catch up all the time. You guys ever feel behind? Yeah. Yes. Come on. I feel behind all the time. And there's a striving, there's a stress, there's this, there's this weight that, De- like Pastor Devin is saying, is not from God. And there is a simple solution to these things. The things of God are weighty, and they can be difficult, but they don't have to be complicated. True. Jesus was not anxious about a schedule, but he did everything that his Father willed in his life. God's growing our capacity to be able to hear his word and obey it. I think a lot of our stress is coming from we hear God's word and we don't obey it. Today is a day where we hear the voice of the Lord and we walk. And we live as he's called us to live. Listen, he, us this morning as a church, God's asking us to reestablish our footing in him. He doesn't want us slipping. He doesn't want us feeling anxious all the time. We sing it a lot. And I'm about done tired asking God to take fear and anxiety away from us. Because he wants our foot not to slip. And how do we do this? We become simple men. Guys, uh, our first scripture today is 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Turn there with us. Say there when you're there. You guys are quiet this morning. Y'all tired or something? There. 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 Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, look at verse 1 with with me. It says, And when I came to you, brothers, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom. Proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Say that's enough. That's enough. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. So that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Come on, guys. We have churches full of men who are there to convince you through clever words and, and, and clever speech and little nugget, gold nuggets of wisdom that Christ is the one whom you should serve. That Yahweh is the God whom you should, whom you should serve. Guys... We're not looking to do that as a church. We're not looking to bait and switch people into God's kingdom and, you know, get them in just enough that we can turn around and be like, oh, wait, yeah, so we didn't actually have the power or the authority. We just had the shiny stuff up front to get you in. Guys, this is not what God has intended for your life. This is not what God has intended for my life, for remnant church, for any of, of Christ's um, bride, the church. He's not intended that. 
Paul did not find it necessary to complicate his life and his mission by man-pleasing, by clever speech, or by posturing. This was a true man of gravitas, as we've spoken about. A man who could hear from God and stand on it no matter the cost. And with no need to sugarcoat any of it. Guys, imagine that. We're, we want to share Jesus with our friends and our co-workers and lost family members and things like that. But how much do you feel the need to chocolate dip the gospel to make it palatable to the person in front of you? Paul did not feel such a way. In fact, he said, just watch the witness of Jesus working through my life and you'll see the Holy Spirit and you'll see power. Some in this room today have no idea what God wants from their lives. Think about this for a second. L listen to me and see if any, if any one of these apply to you. Some in this room today have no idea what God wants from their life. Because you haven't slowed down enough long enough to be able to hear from them. That stress and anxiety over the purpose or the value of your life, there's a simple fix. And we know you will be encouraged today by the things we're going to show you here in these scriptures. Amen. Some in this room have an idea of what God has in store for them, but the desire to serve your own flesh or anything else other than Him has you in a complete standstill in your walk. Is that you today? And we feel that you will also be encouraged and set free today to go and live out everything God has intended for your life. And some in this room finally feel confident that not only have they heard from God, but they are faithfully walking it out. They are faithfully pressing through, yet don't know the answers to those big elephant in the room questions in their lives right now. God's word will encourage you today, church. And... We're here to tell you and show you through all of these scriptures that it does not have to be complicated. It does not have to be a matter of anxiety. It does not have to be a frustrating process. You and I can be set free by the word of God today, and we can go and live out everything God has intended us to. Who in this room considers themselves to be overthinkers? If you just get yourself in a room alone for a little while, you'll probably provoke yourself to sin. Our, our lives, our hearts, our minds have always been some, called to be submitted to the Lord. And listen, I'm not going to mention lukewarmness today. I'm not going to mention things like serving two masters today. Because none of you, none of that's going on here. No, we, we, we most definitely have to check our hearts this morning. What is the weightiness? What is the anxiety? What is all this coming from? Why is this not so simple for you? As we're getting into our message today, we're going to start with this point. The weight of responsibility on you is God's opportunity to you for you to grow in faithfulness and gravitas. That we talked about a couple weeks ago. Don't resist his weighty call. This makes your life complicated and exhausting. Don't resist his weighty call. This makes your life complicated and exhausting. Guys, the kingdom's not complicated. You are. Let's turn to Lamentations 3. Who's ready for things to be simpler in your life? I am. When you get to Lamentations chapter 3, look at verse 25 with us. It's a simple man when you get there. Lamentations 3, verse 25. The Lord is good to those who hope is in Him. To the one who seeks Him, it is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Check this out. It is good for a man to bear the yoke while he's young. Let him sit alone in silence, for the Lord has laid it on him. Come on, you know what that means? Young men, no whining. <laughs> that yoke is on you, that weight is on your shoulders, and he says, sit in silence. He doesn't say, don't worship me. He doesn't say, don't praise my name. When he says, sit in silence, he's like, stop whining about it. <laughs> Pastor, I'm getting tired. It's like, dude, you're relying on your own strength. 
God is the one who sustains us. And isn't it beautiful that he says, it is good for a man to bear the yoke while he is young. Why? Because man within himself will probably end up running away from the Lord. Having a heavy weight on you actually grounds you as a young man. And what it leads to is then sitting alone in silence and then being laid down before him. A lot of times we want to go run out in the field and accomplish something. But somewhere along the way we realize that we're kind of good at building something outside of the Lord. And then it takes us to a place where we forget about him. But carrying his yoke upon our shoulders each, each day, though it is heavy, though there is a responsibility, it's like the kavod, it's the weight of responsibility in the Lord. And what that weight comes with is a viewing an authority to God and seeing him as your master and Lord and saying, Lord, I won't run. I want to lay down and I want you to come and teach me how to do this thing. Today, we want to explain to you the responsibilities with it, even the temple of God in these times. Yes, this is a pretty neat subject to look at. Now, if in the uh, Levitical priesthood in our Bible, there are only two categories of men, right? Well, in the male gender, there are three age groups. There are children, there are young men, and there are old men. <laughs> and young men constant, uh, starts at about the age of 13. That's something that, uh, an age of responsibility, so to say, biblically, right? Now, what we see, though, within the Levit Levitical priesthood is at the age of 25, the young men were able to walk in and serve as the Levitical priest. Now, what was important uh, as far as how um, the, the structure of, of authority and those who were serving in the temple, who were serving in Israel, was that the young men were supposed to do the hard work. Come on, guys. That's a beautiful thing that God intended for the young men to carry the heavy weight, the young men to do the messy work, the young men to do the things that will actually equip them with knowledge and wisdom and authority throughout their lives. So is anybody here over 50 years old? Hey, come on, my dad's here today. Come on. Hey, come on, we got a few people over 50 years old in here. Now, listen to this. After the age of 50, in the Levitical priesthood, in our Bible, the most valuable thing men in that category had going on in their lives is that they would be able to turn around and walk through life with the younger men and show them how to carry the weight day in and day out. It's not your job to carry the heavy weight anymore. It doesn't mean you're not going to work hard. It doesn't mean that you're not a man of authority. It doesn't mean that you should just sit down and be lazy. But what it does mean is the most valuable thing you have in your life is to walk humbly beside the young men who are being humbled and show them how to carry that weight, encourage them along the way, positioning yourself to not be the main person doing the work, but rather walking alongside those whom you are teaching to do the work. Amen? Isn't that a beautiful thing? Jesus even said it. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Why? Because in the same way that these older men would young, walk with these young men, God wants to walk with us in carrying this weight. Yeah. He wants to walk with us in carrying this yoke. Now let me make it clear to you this morning. God's yoke upon your shoulders is not what makes your life complicated and it's not what makes your life exhausted. It's our own selfish nature that does it. It is good for a man to bear the yoke while he is young. Can I get an amen? amen. It causes something to happen in us. We must hit our knees in humility, sit in silence and lay before God for answers. All of us working our jobs, shepherding our families, becoming responsible for your brothers around you. It's not too much for you. It's not too much for you to handle. The weight of responsibility is not too heavy. It is our own sin and idolatry that causes things to be complicated and exhausting. If we, whether we understand it or not, it is the truth. The will, uh, the, the will of God is something that should be a joy to us. Amen. And any times that we're holding on to both the kingdom of God and our own kingdom, that's what produces confusion and weariness within our hearts. Guys, listen to the tone of Isaiah chapter 45. 
verses 9 through 10 with me. It says, Woe to those who quarrel with their maker, those who are nothing but potsherds. <laughs> say potsherds. Potsherds. <laughs> Among the potsherds on the ground. Does the clay say to the potter, What are you making? Does, does your work say the potter has no hands? Woe to the one who says to a father, what have you begotten? Or to a mother, what have you brought to birth? Guys, do we try and make some of the things of God and uh, to make sense of the things of God in our own carnal minds? Like now we, if we are living presently, we have been given the ability, those who are found in Christ in this room, we have been, we have been given the ability to walk in the mind of Christ. But that doesn't mean you're doing it every day. Now, in our carnal minds, as we're trying to live carnal lives, the things of God become very confusing and frustrating. And if, and if we are, what is it then that we are comparing our lives to that, that causes quarreling with us, uh, between us and the one who created us? The yoke that has been placed on our shoulders is good. Man. The intended purpose for your life and for my life is good for us. <laughs> And whenever we push against it, when we fight against it, it becomes double-minded. It becomes confusing. It becomes something that is fruitless and frustrating to our souls whenever we take an account of our life. What Pastor just said was good. Think about this. If you're wholeheartedly serving the Lord, who then do you have to compare your life to? Whenever you're walking wholeheartedly before the Lord, if you catch yourself comparing to somebody else's life, you're looking to go walk away from the life of Jesus that you committed yourself to. Yeah. That's, that's what causes some exhaustion, exhaustion in us. Yeah. Is when we're walking in the light of his presence and then all of a sudden we feel this check in our heart like, I want that. Yeah. Then you drift off into the space and you walk into our wilderness and you don't have any water and then you become exhausted. Guys, Jonah chapter 1 Verse 1 says this. It says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for the port. And after paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Come on. I think it was a couple Thursdays ago. We got a word from the Lord that some of you have been like Jonah. Where God has called you to go and preach or do a task or be obedient to the voice of God, but instead you run away. Listen, we don't have to run, we don't have to read all five chapters of this book for you guys to understand the story. Where did Jonah ultimately end up? He got tossed into an ocean, swallowed by a fish, in utter darkness. Whenever we hear the voice of God, and let me remind you of our point, resisting his waiting calling. This makes your life complicated and exhausting. Did it do that for Jonah? He could have just went. But things got complicated. Yeah. And it wouldn't have been easy from in the first place, church. It wasn't that the journey was going to be easy. It wasn't that God would have blessed him with an easy life because of his obedience. That's not, that's not anything we have been promised in the body of Christ. Yet what, what Jonah could have had was a, uh, you know, a few days not inside of the belly of a fish. <laughs> this is kind of like Israel wandering in the desert for 40 years. Yeah. We overcomplicate things. We make things take longer than they should. So let me tell you this. Whenever you're in your prayer closet asking the Lord um, spe specifically for things to happen in your life, and uh, you don't obey anything that he says, it's your fault. A lot of the times, in a lot of these circumstances, if we're ruled by our own emotions rather than by His Word and by His Spirit, things will become complicated. But His path is straight for us. It's narrow, but it's straight. Amen. So on. today, we're called to walk in it. Yeah, come on, say simple man. Simple, simple man. man. Not all of the weight that you feel right now is from God. Now, we, Pastor Devin just got done explaining to you how when you resist the weight that God has intended for it to be laid on your shoulders, that that complicates and frustrates your life with Him. But also, not all weight on your shoulders is actually from Him. And that's something that we have to check today. Turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and say simple man when you get there. 
Look for verse 16 when you get to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. I know what y'all are thinking. <laughs> Be a simple kind of man. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we thought about that too. All right, y'all in Ecclesiastes 5? Yeah. Come on, it says, this too is a grievous evil. Verse 16. As everyone comes, so they depart. And what do they gain since they toil for the wind? All their days they eat in darkness. Listen to this, guys. All their days. All of your days. Check to see if this applies to you today. They eat in darkness. With great frustration, affliction, and anger. This is what I have observed to be good. That it is appropriate for a person to eat to drink, and to find satisfaction in their toilsome labor Mm. under the sun during the few days, few days of life God has given them. For this is their lot. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and to be happy in their toil, this is a gift of God. They seldom reflect on the days of their life. Guys, listen to this today. They seldom reflect on the days of their life because God keeps them occupied with gladness of heart. You know how much gratitude will change your life today just for what God has already given you? Forget about material possessions right now. I'm not talking about your bank account, your 401k, your IRA, or anything like that. I'm talking about everything else that God has given you. Your family, your wife, your husband, your children, your, your brothers and your sisters, your fathers and your mothers. The mission that God's laid on your family. It's enough, church. It's enough. It's enough. And we don't have to complicate it by coming against such a thing. And because this is where we become those who eat in darkness. It doesn't mean that you're not being fed the word of God. It just means you can hardly understand it because you're sitting in the dark. And it doesn't mean that it's not a blessing to you, but it does mean that you're still always frustrated even though you're reading the word of God. You guys ever have a Bible reading plan or just spend time with the Lord reading his scriptures and your attitude just can't seem to change even after month, after month, after month, after month. This is what we're talking about because there's a frustration and there's a tension between us and our Father in heaven because we are bucking the authority that he has over our lives. How often are you occupied, church, with reflection on what God has given or asked or or what he has asked of you versus some other desire that you have? Does the bread of the word of God now seem stale in your mouth? Think about that. Does the bread of the word of God seem stale and unfulfilling to you? Does it seem that when you hear him, it is through a long, dark tunnel if you hear him at all today? Church, eat, drink, and partake of what God has given you. And do not worry about what you do not have. This is vanity, and it will exhaust you to death, literally. (laughs) Come on. We're going to continue in Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Turn a few pages over to Ecclesiastes 7 and look at verse 15 when you get there. Not all of the weight you feel now is from God. Listen, I can even attest to this, even right now. There's about 30% of you that are completely distracted right now. It means you probably have something in your mind that's greater than the Lord, our Savior. Today is the day to get fed. And the reason why you're walking with so much ex- exhaustion and with so much weight on your shoulders is because you have not allowed God to carry it with you. Who's in Ecclesiastes 5, 16? 7, 15. Sorry. 7.15, y'all there? I have seen everything during my lifetime of futility. There is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness. And there's a wicked man who prolongs his life in wickedness. Do not be excessively righteous and do not be overly wise. Why should you ruin your life? Come on. Let that one challenge you today. Let it challenge you today. (laughs) Do not be excessively righteous and do not be overly wise. Why should you ruin your life? 
This is about posturing. This is about living and portraying yourself to be somebody that you absolutely are not. And it's exhausting you. This revelation came to me about two years ago. As I was beginning to feel the call and weight on my life as a pastor, I did not want it because I thought I'd have to posture for it. But what God began to reveal to me is he says, Devin, you be exactly who I've called you to be. I see it all the time in the way y'all dress and the way that y'all talk and the way that you come up to us and say how you're doing amazing and you're absolutely lying. It's posturing and it's exhausting you. We don't care about your posturing. We can see right through your lies. Do not be excessively righteous and do not be overly wise. When you're coming into the room, you're like, man, I really got this word that's going to make me look awesome today. Man, I really got this word and I'm excited to share it because I want people to know how amazing I am. Oh, dude, look at this outfit today. I'm looking extra manly. Can't wait for Landon to see it. (laughs) Overly wise, speaking of scriptures that you don't even know what it's saying. This is exhausting and it becomes complicated because you're living a life of a lie and that's exhausting. Has anybody kept a lie and you were like, dude, this is really exhausting. That's what you do with your life when you posture. So the thing to combat this very thing is what? It's extreme transparency. That's the only thing. That's what makes it simple. And whenever we become extremely transparent, we get help from our brothers and we get help from our father. And as we're walking in the Lord, that's when we begin to grow to know what actually we're talking about. I tell you, this is what changed my life, is not caring what other people thought. When you live to posture in front of others, or even posture before the Lord, though he sees everything, it's exhausting and it's complicated. Guys, look at Galatians chapter 3 with us today. Look at verse 1 when you get there. Say simple man when you... See, Galatians chapter 3. Simple man. Galatians chapter 3, verse 1 says, You foolish Galatians! Who has bewitched you? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, he asked again. Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? So then, does he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you do it by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? When Pastor Devin's showing you guys in Ecclesiastes chapter 7 that one ought not to be overly or excessively righteous or excessively wise, of course God wants you to live a righteous and pure life. Of course God wants you to have wisdom from heaven and to share it with others. But he does not want you to spend the rest of your life trying to prove someone who you're not to everyone else in the world. Guys, there's a security in this. There's a security that Paul is trying to give to the, Gal- to the church in Galatia. And it's something that you and I have to take a hold of today. It's something that you and I have to take a hold of, not so that we can be like, oh man, I'm a fool, I'm an idiot. It's so that we can walk away with freedom, knowing that we don't have to spend the rest of our lives trying to be someone we're not. We can go among our younger brothers and sisters in the faith and be like, man, I have never heard that from the word. Tell me that one more time. That was feeding me the first time I heard it. We can go before our fathers in the faith and say, I just need your help today. Guys, come on. This is what the kingdom is about. We have been invited to sit at a table as a family in God's kingdom. We weren't invited into a job position in God's kingdom. We weren't invited to come and spend the rest of our lives performing like uh, like a jester for God. That's not us. We were invited as a family, and we want you guys to be secure today in who God is making you to be. Not secure in your sin, but secure with who God has you right now and continue to faithfully walk with Him as He matures you. We're going to spend a couple more minutes on this point because I think it's important. 
Um, I want to pick on the ladies this morning. Because I'm always talking about the men. Which is good. But I want to pick on my lady friends. <laughs> How many times have you actually postured before others? Here's, here's some of the ways that it looks. Somebody's giving you like an encouraging word, especially your husband. And you're like, yeah, I know. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Where you like, just always want to add to his point. That's not sitting in silence and waiting for your salvation. That's posturing. I know everything. I, want, I already know. I already know this. All right, thanks for telling me that A in this point. Or even just for anybody, especially the single people in this room, somebody gives you a word to encourage you, and you're like, thank you for that word, brother. I actually have this to add on top of your encouraging word for me. That's posturing. I hate that. Because you never grow. You just try to be the leader all the time. If we don't move past this, if we don't stop posturing today, we'll never be a unified church. It's about growing. It's like building upon the block. It's actually receiving something. Back to the women. Receive what the Lord has for you through your husband. Receive what has the Lord has for you through a friend. Today is a day to be washed. Be washed today. Stop posturing. You want to appear as a beautiful bride all the time. And yes, in the Lord you are. But sometimes your clothes become dirty and you need to be washed. Stop posturing today. All right, our next point. Be all that God has called you to be. Compromise against his will for your life is idolatry. This makes your life complicated and exhausting. Guys, this means no more than God has intended you to, has intended you to be. Lest you become like the teachers of the law in the days of Jesus, overstepping God's authority everywhere you go. And it also means no less than who God has called you to be, lest you become like a rich young ruler who never even makes it to the table. Mm. Wow. Turn to Ephesians 5, verse 8. Are you all learning something today? Oh, yes. Yes. Ephesians 5, 8 through 14 says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what is the, the disobedient do in secret, but everything is exposed by the light of it becomes visible. And everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it is said, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Come on. Today is the day that we know the times that we are in. Today is the day that we wake up from our sleep and realize that we're not called to be children of darkness, but rather to be children of the light. This is what happens when we live in extreme transparency. And what happens when you live in darkness and you posture yourself and you don't be all that God has called you to be, you receive legs, legs of toothpicks. Any way that comes upon you shatters you. And you don't tell anybody about it. You just keep repairing yourself. That is not the way of the Lord. Are you surviving or are you thriving today, saints? It is His light that illuminates in us. And causes us to be strong, to carry the weight that we've received. Today is the day to stop fooling yourself. Be all that God has called you to be. Guys, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13, Paul is encouraging Timothy to live out his life in a way that all can see. In verse 15, he says, be diligent in these matters and give yourself wholly to them, so that everyone may see your progress. Guys, learning the value of God, uh, uh, we've been learning the value of God developing us as pastors and as friends with many of you right in front of your faces, right? There's, there's not definitely an opportunity for us to posture and act like we already know everything and that we are so many strides ahead or something like that. And we're not here to do that to you or for you or against you. 
There's such a beautiful value in this that observable wins, losses, and recoveries can be seen in our lives. Righteous acts, sinful acts, and repentance can be observed before every one of you as you watch each one of our lives. God is making us to be wholly satisfied in who he is making us to be. This is ridding our flesh of selfish ambitions, removing the noise of godless banter in our ears to influence us away from our calling. Wow. And, crawl, and, and it's creating a posture in us where we are crawling through our homes like, like the Jewish uh, festival of Passover as a child would look for leaven, look for yeast in the home. Uh, God's creating a, a posture in us as we do that to find the leaven, to find the sin in our own homes. Trying to be more than who God has presently allowed you to be will leave you striving and making your life, unlike Timothy here, secretive and manipulative. Climbing a ladder of success in God's kingdom that does not exist and is propped up on man's ego and deception. Amen. Trying to be less than God has presently called you to be will leave you resenting every step of your life as you fall further and further and further behind. Wake up, church. Today, we want you to walk in full freedom, not to walk around with your head hanging low as we point out these things to you, but to be filled with the Holy Spirit and power to fulfill all who God is calling you to be. Guys, we want to we finish this message today with showing you a beautiful example of what it looks like in Joseph's life um, to be a simple man. Turn to Genesis chapter 37 with us. While you guys are turning there, I wanted to share a quote that we found that is pretty awesome. It's from David Platt. It says, If we were left to ourselves with the task of taking the gospel to the world, we would immediately begin planning innovative strategies and plotting elaborate schemes. We would organize conventions, develop programs, and create foundations. But Jesus is so different from us. With the task of taking the gospel to the world, he wandered through the streets and byways. All he wanted was a few men who would think as he did, love as he did, and see as he did, teach as he did, and serve as he did. All he needed was to revolutionize the hearts of a few, and they would impact the world. How simple is that? (laughs) Guys, this is the life of a simple man, of a simple woman. In Christ, where it is not so complicated. In Genesis chapter 37, verse 1, it says, Now Jacob lived in the land where his father had sojourned in the land of Canaan. There are the record, uh, here are the records of his generations. We're going to skip to verse 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all of his sons, because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a very colored or a full length tunic. His brothers saw that their father loved him more than all of his brothers. And so they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. Then Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, please listen to my dream, which I have had. For behold, we are binding sheaves in the field. And lo, my sheep rose up and stood erect. And behold, your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to mine. Then his brothers said to him, are you actually going to reign over us? Or are, you, or, or are you really going to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. No, he had still another dream and, relate, and related it to his brothers and said, Lo, I have still another dream. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. He, re, he relayed this to his father And to his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream that you have had? Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come to bow ourselves down before you on the ground? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father, he kept these things in his mind. Joseph was unapologetically who God was making him to be. Jacob had no idea. The sons of Israel had no idea the way that Joseph would save all of their lives in the years to come. They had no idea that that bowing down before their brother, before Jacob, before his son, also meant the salvation of their lives in a time of famine. He was challenged and rebuked, Joseph was, whether he was right or wrong to share it the way that he did. 
He was beloved by his father, but his brothers grew to hate him and they turned on him. And when he was and when there was nothing to substantiate his claims of the dreams that God had given him, he stood confidently on the word of the Lord because he did not have selfish ambitions mixed into it. Mom, Genesis 46, 31 through 47. It continues throughout his life. Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go up and tell Pharaoh and will say to him, my brothers and my father's household who are in the land of Canaan have come to me. And the men are shepherds, for they have been keepers of the the livestock, and they have brought their flocks and their herds and all they have. When Pharaoh calls to you and says, what is your occupation? You shall say, your servant has been keepers of livestock from our youth, even until now. Both we we and our fathers, that you may live in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is loathsome to the Egyptians." Then Joseph, Joseph went in and told Pharaoh and said, My father and my brothers and their flocks are their, and their herds, all, herds and all that they have have come out of the land of Canaan. And behold, they are in the land of Goshen. Then Pharaoh said to his brothers, What is your occupation? They said to Pharaoh, Your servants are shepherds, both we and our fathers. They said to Pharaoh, We have to uh, come to... Sojourn in the land, for there is no pasture for your servants' flocks, for the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. Now, therefore, please let your servants live in the land of Goshen. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is at your disposal. Settle your fathers and your brothers in the best of the land. Let them live in the land of Goshen. And if you know any capable men among them, then let the uh, then put them in charge of my lifestyle. Church, Joseph had been betrayed by his brothers and under his father's authority, under his father's authority of their family, was captured and sold into slavery, was then accused of rape, thrown in a prison, prophesied to a Pharaoh, and is now at the, is in second command at the right hand of Pharaoh over the most powerful nation on the face of the planet at its time. There is something beautiful about that. Even in a famine, Joseph was able to to deliver his kinsmen, not only to safety, but to a beautiful and prosperous land. Guys, we're telling you today, God wants you to have Goshen. He wants you to live in the beautiful land. He wants you to live with the perspective that what he has in store for you is beautiful. That what he has intended for you is exactly what you need. And Joseph's counsel to his kinsmen was to be authentically themselves, just as Joseph had been throughout his life up to this point. He said, whenever you stand before Pharaoh, tell him you are shepherds, because you are shepherds. Now, shepherds are loathsome, it says, to Egypt. It's funny, there's something similar about that to even our own nation today that we could have all the authority in the world in the hands of politicians or in some agency, but in the hands of shepherds, in the hands of fathers, you guys see the family unit under attack today? Do you see the real church of Christ under attack today? It's because the world, the fleshly carnal world, hates shepherds. But God wants you to live in the beautiful land of Goshen. God has made his chosen people to be shepherds, a category of men that the world hates. And, but this allowed Israel to remain set apart from Egypt in many different ways throughout their stay in Egypt. This placed them on the most beautiful territory of Egypt, and they were still provided for in every way, and even were entrusted with the treasures of a carnal and pagan king. Guys, if, even, even your successful ambitions and desires, if you lay them down today, if you lay down the distractions on your life, anything apart from what God has been speaking to you and to your family, then we promise you that not only will he care for you, but he will give you the best of the land. You can see that in the story of Israel over and over and over again. You might not be rich as the world says rich. You might not be wealthy as the world considers wealthy, but you will be 
rich in the things of God. And you will have a father in heaven whom was prophesied about earlier today that he owns a cattle on a thousand hills and you will have everything you need because your father owns it all. Guys, we want to finish today with telling you this. When we decide to be a simple man, a man who is confident, a woman who is confident in who God has made them to be, there is no need for striving, for posturing, or man-pleasing. Because you are living out no less and no more, but exactly who God has intended to, you to be. And there is a freedom for you in that today. Amen. Yeah. Go ahead and stand with us. If your life has become complicated and exhausting, and you want to be free from that today, lift up your hands. Lord God, we've done it our own way at times. Lord God, we've re- resisted the weighty calling that you've had on our, on our lives, Lord God. And today, we want to submit to all the plans that you have for us. Lord God, we strive, Lord God, and we do things, Lord God, to make people like us, Lord God. But there's only one that we need to truly be caring about, and that is you. Lord, we're done posturing. Lord God, we're done acting like somebody that we're not, Lord God. We're ready to walk in humility today, Lord. We want to be simple men and women. Lord God, we live in a world and a society where there's so many gods to run after, Lord God. But you've called us to be the one who proclaims your name above all else. Lord God, to make it clear that you are the only one, Lord, that can be followed. Lord, help us to be simple men. Lord, we don't need many things of this world anymore. Lord God, we don't need to live a life, Lord God, that says, I'm of this value to this person. Lord, we just want to be valuable to your kingdom. Lord God, get our priorities right today, Lord, that that we would get our priorities right in your kingdom, Lord God, that we would shed off the weight that you're calling us not to carry, Lord, and put on the yoke that you're calling us to carry today. Lord God, we're done with comparisons. We're done with games. Lord, we're ready to be truthful about who we really are. Lord God, and who you're really calling us to be. Lord, today I'm saying that we're excited to implement these things. Lord God, we're excited, Lord God, to do your will. Lord, we're excited that these things are simple, Lord God, that when you called out all men, Lord God, every man that was grown to you did not um, struggle or did not have to have some sort of characteristic, or you made the characteristics in them to be able to do your will. Lord, so today we're excited to implement these things. Lord, we love your body. Lord, we love your spirit, and we thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Y'all be blessed. Have a good day.